Hey there, guys. One thing I've always wondered about is why in the world J. Richard Seitz and APA were so successful while Clifford Van Beek's National Pastime was such a failure. I actually talked about this in my blog briefly a little over a year ago. The answers I received from my readers were usually some variation of the market wasn't ready yet. Now, after looking into it, I wondered if Van Beek didn't pick the wrong time to market a tabletop baseball game. After all, it's well known that kids usually don't buy baseball cards in the winter. But I think something else might be going on. Now, you see, there's this narrative that's popped up over the years, this idea that entrepreneurs simply aren't capable of successfully marketing their own products. Clifford Van Beek's story seems to fit into this type of logic. He was the first to market. This seems to me to be beyond question. Dice baseball games before national pastime were primitive and incapable of reproducing anything even remotely resembling real-life statistics. His game was complex. Now, it wasn't a perfect simulation of baseball, but it was also much better than its critics claim. It's fast, it's playable, it remains fun almost 100 years later, and its matrix method is quite innovative, though a little bit cumbersome. I don't think that there's anything wrong with how Clifford Van Beek created his game. He used high-quality materials. Now, this was certainly no cloth game like Monopoly, it's contemporary. But I think that's where we get to what Clifford Van Beek did wrong. Clifford didn't seem to have done much by the way of market research. From what we can tell, it seems that Van Beek created his game, decided on a price, and quickly ordered 500 copies from his printer. We know now that Clifford Van Beek's printer never went bankrupt. It was actually Van Beek himself who went bankrupt, not the printer. It very well may have been Clifford Van Beek's ambition and dream that ended up getting the better of him. Now, J. Richard Seitz, on the other hand, he took things slow. Based on what I've read, J. Richard Seitz only had 137 sets of APA printed in 1951. That was less than half of Van Beek's ambitious first print were run 20 years earlier. In fact, it was, I think, about a fourth. I'm not sure that Seitz knew that or not. Seitz continued to work a full-time job and pursued his side business only in his spare time. He marketed the game from his kitchen table. Now, he may have had dreams of making this hobby of his big one day, but science took it one step at a time. He fought his hardest against incurring expenses that might drown his baby before it ever had a chance to grow. That's a lesson I think that we can all learn. Sometimes it's better to take things slow. Sometimes it's better to go one step at a time instead of trying to make something completely perfect right from the start. Now, we see a lot of that today. Now, no blogger is going to amass a huge following overnight. YouTube channels generally do not become overnight sensations. Those that do, those that have all sorts of viral memes and follow the trends closely and try to trick people into watching them, you know what I'm talking about, they tend to fade away as quickly as they once rose. Lasting influence, lasting success does not come from following trends. It comes from making friends, from building up communities, and taking things one step at a time. It also doesn't come from incurring huge amounts of expenses or for trying to start a project that is way above your head or that requires you to put more into it than you can possibly afford at the current time. Now, J. Richard Seitz was no perfect man. We'll get more into that as we go along here. But when it comes to business, J. Richard Seitz knew how to keep his ambitions in check. Above all, the thing that differentiates the two men more than anything else is that Seitz knew how to keep his expenses down. And he knew that it wasn't worth it to get every single thing perfect right from the start. I've never seen an original copy of National Pastime. I've also never seen an original 1951 edition of APA Baseball. Both of those are so rare and so difficult to find that I doubt many people have seen both. But from what I've seen in photos and what I've read in descriptions, I'm fully confident that Clever Van Beek's game, in terms of its printing quality, in terms of the longevity of its boards, was probably superior to J. Richard Seitz's game. 
The funny thing is that the games were so similar, not quite identical, but so similar that they clearly had something to do with each other. And yet, one, Flavor Van Beek was bankrupt before he could come out with a second season. It was done before most people had any idea that there was even an advertisement for it in the sporting news. J. Richard Seitz, on the other hand, grew slowly, a little bit at a time, bit by bit, and ended up becoming one of the richest, if not the most successful, of the baseball simulation entrepreneurs really ever. So it's I know it's a kind of difficult topic to work your head around, right? A lot of us don't play these games, right? There still are people who play a lot of APA who, as a result, will pay attention to this, will care about national pastime. There are, I know, other people who would say, well, this doesn't really matter. Hal Richmond came out with Stratomatic. It's clearly a different game than national pastime and than APA. But the truth is that this market was formed by these guys. And it was really Clifford Van Beek who had this idea that there might be a market out there for this type of game. It didn't exist beforehand. It simply did not exist. When Clifford Van Beek came around and pushed his ideas forward and gave it a try, he got the idea out and was able to inspire somebody who knew how to take the idea and knew how to make it grow, how to give it a chance instead of dumping a bunch of money into it, watching the company go bankrupt, and then kind of shrugging your shoulders and going back and trying something else. Anyway, if we're going to learn anything from this at all, anything from the comparison between Clifford Van Beek and J. Richard Sides, the important thing to learn is that when you're creating anything as an entrepreneur, whether it's a YouTube channel, whether it's stories or a book that you're writing, whether you're just trying to have fun with your friends, come up with a little club, have some sort of hobby, whatever it is you're doing, or if you're trying to create a major business and trying to you know, go out there and compete with the big guys, regardless of what it is that you're doing, the thing that we learn from these men and from their examples is that you need to start slow. You need to give it room to grow. Don't expect to jump in and to have sudden and wild success from the start. It's probably not going to happen. But if you let it grow, if you grow a community, if you create something, and if you give it some time and if you're patient, it very well might grow into something big. And maybe you'll be like J. Richard Seitz was after five, six, seven years. And then you can take your dream and your hobby Turn it into your full-time job. Anyways, a little bit of uh, business-related wisdom for you guys today. I hope that you have a wonderful day. I'll talk with you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.